One person here this morning, but I thank God for each and every one of you because it's by faith that you believe that God speaks to a five foot six, bald head, black African American, and, and the word of God that comes through my mouth is for you. And I don't take that for granted because I know as the temperature soars, there's a great temptation to want to say, I'm packing it in, I'm staying at home to get ready for next week. But I thank you in advance for this week. I thank you that you've made Step of Faith part of your worship experience this morning. And let's give God a hand of praise for that. <laughs> Amen. Our scriptures that will be coming that I'll be coming from and we'll be looking at this morning will be found in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 4 and verse 5. And we'll be standing for the word of God this morning. Would that be all right? Yes. yes. All right, I got half of y'all to say it okay. I'm rolling with the majority. <laughs> The book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Are we ready? Yes. Let's read. Each one of us has a body with many parts, and these parts all have different uses. In the same way, we are many, but in Christ we are all one body. Each one is a part of that body, and each part belongs to all the other parts. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. In concert, let's read. He is far above all rulers, authorities, powers, lords, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but also in the world to come. God has put everything under the control of Christ. He has made Christ the head of everything for the good of the church. The church is Christ's body and completes him as he feels everything in every way. Father God, I thank you this morning that your word is traveling right as we're speaking, speaking right now. I thank you, Lord, that you're about to perform a spiritual MRI. I thank you this morning, Lord, that your word runs swiftly. And I thank you, Lord, that it will accomplish the very task that it was sent out to do. I thank you where one might need encouragement, you'll, it will be provided. I thank you, Lord, that where one might need to be challenged, Lord, I thank you that it will be provided. One might need a confirmation. I thank you, Lord, that you will be multitasking all throughout this service through your word. Thank Thank you, Lord, for the way you, you treat us with your word. And I pray, Father, this morning that you would hide the messenger behind your cross and that my words would be your words, Lord, and we would be one. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated. The book of Romans is one of my favorite books. One of my favorite books. Matter of fact, the men are studying uh, the book of Romans. We've been in the book of Romans for the last, I want to say, three months. We've been studying from Romans 1, and we're currently on Romans chapter 8. But the book of Romans was wrote by the Apostle Paul. Um, and during this segment of scripture, the Apostle Paul is inside of a prayer that he is lifting up for the believers at Ephesus. The Apostle here, Paul, is praying for real. He is praying for real, not the, the little good bread, good meat, good God, let's see prayer. No, 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 no. See, I want you to understand some of my brother and sister. Paul, the apostle, is aware of his current situation. He understands that he is imprisoned. He understands that he's probably facing execution. He's aware and understand the, what the totality of, of what the beatings have done to his body. And as well as the isolation that he's in. He's not inside of the county jail with all the laptops and computers and the cushions. He's inside of a dark, cold, nasty dungeon. But... Even though he's aware of his current situation, as bleak as it might look, he is also aware of the situation of the church in Ephesus. My brothers and sisters, we are actually reading Paul's prayer. 
after Paul received word about the condition of the church in Ephesus, Paul does what he can with what he has in the situation that he currently finds himself in. He's in prison. So what can he do? He prays. Paul is a seasoned believer at this time on his second incarceration. Paul knows a thing or two about walking with the Lord. He understands how quickly things can change. Paul knows by experience that what was a priority one hour ago can be replaced depending on what the need is. Are you with me? And so it appears that our brother Paul gets the 411 or the information about what's taking place at the church that he birthed, which is in Ephesus. And he does not commit, once he finds out the information, he does not commit what I like to call the forgetful lie. Y'all know what the forgetful lie is, don't you? Step of faith, y'all know sometimes when people might ask you for prayer and you tell them, I'll be praying for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or, or I'll be sure to lift you up in prayer tonight. But you end up lying because you forgot. Oh, well, I'm talking about that church. I know it's, it don't never happen to y'all. I got to go across the street to that other church. But, but sometimes we, we tell folks we're going to pray for them, but because of priorities changing and shifting throughout the day, we actually forget sometimes. Not because we were being lazy, not because we were slothful, but certain things just enter our mind and, and certain things get lost in the shuffle. But we end up lying because we forgot. But Paul does, see what Paul does to make sure he's not um, uh, lying. Uh, he doesn't wait until he's released so that he can be with them in order to pray. Paul does not wait until he gets off of the work detail in order to pray. No, no, no. He does not put off praying until the game is over. No, Paul does not say, I'll call you back so that we can pray. No, 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 no. Paul is not of that mindset. Paul is of the mindset, if y'all can't come and visit me, I'll I'll, I'm still praying. If I can't get there and touch and agree with you, I'm still praying. If the prison guards around me are cussing and fussing, guess what? I'm still praying. If you can't co accept, collect calls, I'm praying. Nothing is going to stop me or hinder me. There is no barrier that can prevent me. There is no law that can prohibit me. There is no rule that can restrict me from praying for the church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Paul is of the mindset that I might not have a phone to call you or to text you on. I might not have access to a laptop or a desktop. I might not be too tech savvy, but instead of focusing on what I don't have, on what I can't do, let me look around this cell and see what I do have in order to get this prayer to you. Somebody had me a pen and a piece of paper. That's Paul mindset. I, I can't get to him. I don't have a, a phone. I don't have a, a, a access to my, to my horse or, or to the donkeys where I can ride. Hand me a pen and a piece of papyrus and, and, and then I'll write the letter. Somebody hand me this, these articles that I need. Footnote. We can learn something from the Apostle Paul this morning. Paul should be etched in our minds as he goes through these troubled times while he's incarcerated, still thinking about the church. Inside of his own hellish storm, he has the bold audacity to step outside of that and be concerned for somebody else. Footnote, work with what you got where you're at. Work with what you got where you're at. So many times, no, I'm not gonna say so many times, 
There have been a few times where what we're going to do for God depends on a perfect circumstance and perfect timing. Well, if that's the case, a lot of things that God has put on the plate to be done will not be done. If that's the case, a lot of people with potential will be taking that potential that's untapped to their grave, waiting on the perfect time and the perfect set of circumstances. Because right about the time that you say, once my money get right, I'll be able to... Uh, give to the church. Uh, what, soon as you, soon as that happens, the radiator leaks, the AC goes out. There will never be a perfect time to do what it is that you want to do. You might say that I'll start going out on the outreach uh, once the kids go to school. But the trouble of the situation or the matter of it is, once the kids get to school, there will be another scenario that will stop you. You have to be of the mindset that come hell or high water, God has given me a gift and with the power that he gives me to live out that day, I'm going to use that gift. I ain't going to get no claps right there, but that's all right. I ain't studying this morning. God has given each and every one of us gifts, right? See, the Lord does not hold us accountable for the time that we don't have or the things that we don't possess. But he does hold us accountable for the time we actually have and the things we do possess. So Paul writes a prayer that's in the form of a letter. The apostle comes from a place of sincerity and concern. He is not using the Christian code words. You know, when somebody's real messed up, you say, they need prayer. Or I'll pray for you. You know, that's the new thing that you can tell when you get on the phone. Hey, uh, hey, hey, sister, um, can I talk to you? Have you heard what's going on with Sister Robin? Yeah, uh, well, all I can say is she need prayer. You see, we, we don't we don't wanna we don't wanna we found a slick way to gossip in the name of Jesus. We don't wanna say, we don't wanna come straight out and gossip because we've been saved, our life has been changed, out with the old, behold, the new has come. So, oh, such and such needs prayer. See, see, in order to gossip or to tear a person's character to shreds, we come up with cold words. Uh, uh, I'll pray for you. So when you hear somebody say that and they ain't got the right facial alignment, they're saying that you're really screwed up. You're really messed up in this season. His prayer, Paul's prayer, though, was initiated by concern. When you receive information about someone, are you concerned or nosy? When you receive information about someone, are you concerned or nosy? How do you tell? How do you tell? Well, if you first take the information that you received about someone to God in prayer, you are concerned. Mm -hmm. But if you first get on the phone and share the information with somebody else, I'm going to hate to say it, you're a little nosy. You see, Paul was concerned about the believers because he could relate to these believers. How do you know that Paul was concerned, Pastor? How do you know that Paul had a relationship with these believers, Pastor? Listen to the words that he uses in prayer. In this prayer that Paul writes down to the church at Ephesus, Paul thanks God, thank you for their faith. He prays that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in order to know Jesus better. He prays that they would have confidence in God's calling them to their salvation. He also wants them to know that they are God's inheritance. He wants them to know that they are God's inheritance. A lot of times we hear folks preach and teach about our inheritance in Christ. We hear about what's in it for us. Uh, we get the peace. Uh, we get the joy. We want the triple anointing. We want the restored anointing. I want the double blessing. I want the manifold blessing of God. Everything that we get in God. But have you ever read the Bible where it says that God is getting something out of each and every one of us? We are his inheritance. 
And you know why? You know why you're saved by grace and you're still saved even though sometimes we still blow it? You know why? Because God doesn't blow or get rid of his inheritance like we'll squander ours like Esau. Esau gave his inheritance up for a pot of camel soup. God says, no, even when you're not faithful, I'm faithful. Because I want mine. I want what's in you. I know what I've put in you. I know the deposits I've made in you. You see, not only does he pray that they could know that they are God's inheritance, but he wants them to know that they are a glorious and wealthy inheritance. He prays that they would experience the unlimited greatness of the power of God that is working in their life. Paul also wants them to know that this power that they have is what God used to raise Jesus from the grave. Are you with me? But not only did this power raise Jesus from the grave, but it also placed Jesus on the throne on the right hand of the Father in heaven. My brothers and sisters, Paul's prayer doesn't stop there. But he continues in his prayer, verse 21. Let's look at verse 21. Verse 21 says, He, meaning Jesus, is far above all rulers, authorities, powers, lords, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but also in the world to come. Earlier, in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 28, Jesus says something that is profoundly enriching. He says, all authority, somebody say all authority, all authority. in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Paul is saying to the book, what Paul is saying to the believers, I want you to catch this, is the Father has made the Son, Jesus, superior in position, unmatched in name, supreme in glory, having no equal in honor, and Jesus is the ultimate in authority. There is no one higher, there is no one more important, there is no one more glorious, there is no one with a greater swag, or no one that's more authoritative than Jesus Christ. Yes. The Christians in Ephesus, they heard these things. They knew these things, right? When Paul was there the first time. So he's writing to tell them the same thing again. But it triggered me when I, when I read that. Because that's sort of like us. You know, these folks needed to be reminded uh, to, let, to let it sink in deep in their hearts and their minds what and who Jesus was. My brothers and sisters, we are Christians and often, often, let me not say often, sometimes, I think we take that to mean that we identify with the baby in the manger who's warm and cuddly. Or better yet, sometimes being Christians, we identify with the Jewish teacher who was persuasive and captivating. Or we often identify with the betrayed and tortured, naked, bleeding martyr on the cross. But my brothers and sisters, Jesus was all those things and they are very important to who we are as the church, but I believe someone here on this morning at Step of Faith needs to know that he is no longer in the manger. Jesus is no longer operating as a carpenter by trade. He is no longer walking the streets as a teacher or hanging on the cross. According to the word of God, he is raised from the dead and seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion not only in this age but also in the one to come. 
My brothers and sisters, we don't just follow a crucified Savior. We follow a resurrected and glorified Savior. We don't just follow a great teacher or a great ruler or a great authority figure or a great power. We follow the greatest teacher, yeah. the true ruler, with yeah. the name of all authority yeah. and all power. His name is Jesus. Jesus. His name is power. His name is power. Sometimes, just sometimes, we have problems sometimes. And it's so easy for us to walk around our day and feel the atmosphere with the strength of our problems. You, like, um, I might forget to uh, leave the toilet seat, you know, put the toilet seat back down, right? So sometimes my wife will walk around the house, I can't believe it, let the toilet seat down. All right, I'm gonna put the toilet seat down and I don't want to clean this, I know you know I gotta use the bathroom. So, 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 so she's filling the air with all that. But if we sometimes would take our focus off of what we think has been done and put it on the name of Jesus and start speaking Jesus, a lot of things can happen Amen. that would be in our favor. Yes. Amen. I can't believe, I ain't talking about you no more. I can't believe all he made was $446. Oh, and then he spent some of it on rims, and I can't believe that he don't know how to treat a, a woman. And it's a long time since he put me out on a date and filling all of that atmosphere with all that negative strength instead of Jesus. The name of Jesus is power. Start speaking Jesus in your situation. The problem is when you start fixating on your issues, you're no longer worshiping Jesus. You're worshiping your problem. Verse 22. Oh, thank you so much. Verse 22 says, God has put everything, somebody say everything. Everything. Under the control of Christ. He has made Christ the head of everything for the good of the church. For the good of my job. For the good of my family. For the good of my friends. For the good of my company, no. for the good of the church. church. The church is Christ's body and completes him as he feels everything in every way. Why is that important? You know, in the book of Genesis, God gave Adam dominion and authority over the entire earth. Did you know that, Yolanda, sister Yolanda? He gave man a dictator to not only to, to own it, but to manage it and control it. Verse 27 in Genesis says this. So God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. God blessed them and said, have many children and grow in number." Fill the earth and be its master. Rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds up in the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What? What a command. What empowerment. We know what happened to that, don't we? We know exactly what happened. God put him in a garden. He has multitudes, a garden of trees. A garden of fruit to eat from. God said, just don't eat from the one. Isn't that interesting that the human, the human nature is that we can have 5,000 free trees, mm -hmm. but it could be one little dried up tree that don't even give much fruit. The fruit is sour, and that's the one that's off limit. But instead of focusing on all the freedom we have with the 4,000 trees, oh, we're figuring one. out how we can break the law yeah. to eat these sour yeah. fruits <laughs> over here. True. Adam sinned by eating from the one tree that the Lord commanded him not to. And in this one act of treason by Adam, it brought death to the earth. Also from that sin, Adam gave his authority 
to Satan by obeying him instead of God. Where are you getting this from, Pastor? Strict scripture confirms this in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Let's look at it on the overhead. Romans, if you keep, give me one more. One more. Okay, for real, one more. <laughs> Surely you know that you become the slaves of whatever you give yourselves to. Anything or anyone, anyone you follow will be your you can follow sin or you can obey God. Following sin brings spiritual death, but obeying God makes you right with him. The enemy confirms that authority was given to him. In Luke chapter 4, verse 6, put that on there, Miss D. And the devil said to him, meaning Jesus, I will give to you all this authority and its glory for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I wish. Who gave it to him? Adam, through his disobedience. You see, since it was a man who lost his authority, it would have to be a man who retrieved that authority into Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the first Adam lost his God-given dominion and authority, but the Bible says that the last Adam, Jesus, regained dominion and authority. Yeah. Scripture also confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter. 15 verse 45 and it reads so it is written the first man Adam became a living being the last Adam a life giving spirit Jesus' death was the ransom paid for our sins let the word testify in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 as God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. God has put everything under the control of Christ. Scripture agrees and testifies also to that in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. And it reads, Therefore, God has also uh, has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why, 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 why? Why did God give all this power to Jesus? I mean, yeah, Jesus deserved it. And yeah, Jesus is God's only son. But when you really think about it, when you really think about this, Brian, but Jesus was already God. And so in reality, he already had this kind of power. So why does God make a point of declaring Jesus to be the supreme ruler over the entire created universe? Let me answer that in the next five words that should and will excite us if we are in Christ this morning. Why are we hearing so much about the power. Why this morning in these texts are we hearing so much about God's authority and power? Let me tell it to you in these words. For the good of the church. Let me say it another way. Jesus is the head of the church. Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 4 and 5, each one of us has a body with many parts, and these parts all have different uses. In the same way, we are many, but in Christ, we are all one body. Each one is a part of that body, and each body part belongs to all the other parts. Being, in, being the body of Christ 
is a symbol of how we are all to work together for a common purpose, amen? Mm -hmm. And as this is done, as we follow the, the, the directions that come from the head, which is Jesus. Christ is the head of the church and we are the body of the church. The anatomy of our bodies will testify that a body without a head is a dead body. Also, our anatomy will testify that the skin that covers our heads is the same skin that covers our bodies, which means that that same blood that flows through the head is the same blood that flows through the body that the body has. The, what am I trying to say? The same power that the head has, the body participates in. The same power that flows from the head, which is Christ, is the same power that should be flowing through his body. But here lies the problem. Some of us are listening this morning and thinking this. I hear what you're saying, Pastor, about all this power that we have because of Jesus. You're saying, I believe in Jesus, but... I, my life ain't, it, it isn't really full of all that joy right now. There is nothing powerful about me except maybe my anger or my attitude or my anxiety. I'm not seeing my needs being met. And while you're talking about power, I don't feel no power flowing through me. My brothers and sisters, when the Christian life doesn't seem to work and we feel like somebody lied to us, you weren't lied to. You just haven't been using the power. So if you get fed up with the Christian life sometimes, it might be honestly that you're just not plugged in. Huh. Hold on. How do you know if you're plugged in? Mm -hmm. Well, how do you know if you're plugged in or not? Can I give a little, little quick analogy. Mm -hmm. That rigamajigama right there, what is that called? Projector. Projector, thank you, okay. How do we know that's plugged in? The light's on, so it's working. It's doing what it was designed to do. Yes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. This overhead is serving the needs of others. You can know you are plugged into the power of God when you are serving the needs of others with joy. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can know you are using the power of God when you are actually doing something for God. And when there is and where there is joy and fulfillment in doing it. You see, this power that God gives us has a peculiar characteristic. It only happens when you begin to act. Can you think of one time that Jesus acted in a supernatural way and it did not benefit no one else? It only happens when you begin to act. When you and I begin to exercise the gifts that God has given us, then the power begins to flow, but not before. Then God will work through you to accomplish things that will leave you shook and gasping and even sometimes looking double takes at what he's done. You did, sometimes you won't feel this power and you, and you don't suddenly feel strong or capable or mighty when you have this power. No, 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 you might even, deep inside, you might feel weak, but feeling weak is not a hindrance to the power if you're plugged in. If you're plugged in, the power God has placed in you will flow through you. Watch this. And at other times, the power God placed in another person will flow to you. Are you catching that? Mm -hmm. 
Do you know they got a sea in, in Jerusalem? It's called the Dead Sea. Anybody know why they call it the Dead Sea? It takes water in, but the water becomes stale and stagnant because it has no way for the, for the, for the, for the water to get back out again. So the water just sits in there and just, you know, just gets stale. Did, it, did you know that just before World War II, a school in Texas caught fire and killed 263 children who couldn't escape? Afterwards, from this fire and this tragedy, the town decided to never let such a disaster ever happen again. So when they built the new school, they installed the best, the best, the best sprinkler system, you caught that, that money could buy. It was a state-of-the-art sprinkler system. Reassured by this, the parents again began to send their children to school, to the school. Within seven years, though, the town had grown and the school needed to be enlarged. As, as the workmen began construction, they discovered a frightful fact. The best sprinkler system their money could buy had never been connected to the water line. Oh. This story might make us upset or feel some type of way, but the truth is, sometimes, as Christians, we can live our life in the same way. Just like the sprinkler system, sometimes we might not even be plugged into the power. God, the Bible says, God has given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. God has already, in Christ, given us every spiritual blessing. We are complete in Christ, you see. Sometimes we think we're waiting for a miracle, but God is saying, be the miracle. Yeah, Sometimes the power, the power is not for you. The power is to go flow to you, but through you. The problem is when our focus is off and we're focused on our kingdom, we're not seeing no power because God didn't ever say anything about our kingdom. He said, seek ye first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. But we're trying to supply kingdom power over to our kingdom and we get frustrated because our kingdom is not, is not equipped to handle that. But all we need to do is put our focus his back on his kingdom, his righteousness, and watch that power flow. When you go out and speak to your co-workers, when you go out and speak to your neighbors. I was talking to Brian the other day, and I got convicted. Um, it was, we were having coffee, and I realized something. I think most of you know about these neighbors I got. I got some neighbors, and they're just like, off the chart, man. I mean, four o'clock in the morning, they're partying. It's cars all up and down the block. I mean, it, we're grown in there. All up down the street, you can find used condoms and all this stuff, man. It's just, it's crazy, right? And my neighbor tapes it. And so he goes, look at this. I don't know how you get any sleep. Three and thirty in the morning, boom, in the box, right? So since they've been there, guess what? I've been looking at them heathens. Oh, I can't stand them. They need to move. Man, see, the devil is getting busy around here. Oh, I got to plead the blood. Get these folks, remove them around here, Jesus. Oh, they taking over everything. They don't know how to act. Oh, they, it ain't them. they releasing demons in the atmosphere, right? I'm going through all this, right? And then as I'm walking, Friday night, I'm walking. And as I'm walking to my house with the dogs for my prayer walk, I'm saying to my son, can't nobody do me like Jesus. And they're walking to the house. It's like three girls. They're walking. It's like four cars parked on the front. So they have a party there, right? So I'm walking. I'm like, oh, they parked in my spot. So I'm walking with the dogs. They're looking back at me, black guy with two dogs. And they're wondering, where's he going? So I'm walking. So I cut to my house. And as I'm cutting there, the Lord spoke to me. Well, the Holy Spirit left an impression in my heart. And said, your focus is off. Mm -hmm. You know why your focus is off? They're acting the way they're supposed to act. 
I, this is a test to, to see if I can place somebody who don't know me right directly next to you. But you're so fixated in your kingdom being interrupted that you're not focusing on my kingdom. Because if you did, you would see that those teenagers have a level of influence. There are nine to ten teenagers with cars that are coming there. But I, but I won't minister to the one teenager who has the influence, but I'm praying for the youth ministry. What am I trying to say? We have to make sure we're plugged in to the right purpose for the right kingdom. Amen. 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 Father God, I just thank you for today.